Hey everybody, this is Craig Garber. Welcome to Everyone Loves Guitar. And I am with uh, extremely talented musician, producer, engineer, jack of all trades, the one and only Joe Blanton. He's a really cool guy. Uh, he's a super talented guitarist as well. Uh, quick quick uh, announcement. I want to just say thank you to our mutual friend, Warner Hodges, for connecting us. I appreciate it, Warner. And also make sure you go to everyonelovesguitar.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to the show. If you're watching us on YouTube, hit the subscribe button and the little icon, that, the emoji that looks like a bell. That helps us out with YouTube algorithms. Thank you for that. All righty. Joe Blanton originally planned on going to University of Tennessee to study art. He switched to music after he graduated, and 18 months later, his band had 14 major label offers on the table as a result of the self-financed EP they did. They signed with A&M. The band was called the Royal Court of China, and they released three albums. He moved to L.A. during the A&M years. He got very much into recording, and he wanted to learn as much as possible about the studio, which he now knows proficiently. He lived out in L.A., two blocks from Warner Hodges, Everybody lives wherever Warner's living. I have someone on the show. I live two blocks in Andy York. I met Warner Hodges in New York. We live right around the corner. I'm like, holy shit. Uh, both, of, both Warner and, and uh, Joe then moved back to Nashville, and they picked up where they left off riding together, which they still do to, to this day. Uh, this was around 09. He started writing songs with Jason Ringenberg, of course, from Jason the Scorchers, who was recently on the show. Uh, and they were writing songs for professional sports team. Joe's studio was growing and they were cranking stuff out. Warner then introduced him to Dan Baird. What is this? That's a trilogy. It's like Warner, Dan, and then the other person's always rotating. It's like the, the <laughs> trilogy, the, the, the three-legged stool. Um, and they got along great and they started a band called the Bluefields, which was actually the name of a neighborhood. I had wondered where that came from, a, a, a neighborhood that Joe lived in. He had no idea that what was going to happen at that time, that the best and most enjoyable part of his music journey was going to start in his 40s. They've toured, the Bluefields have toured all over the U.S. and Europe. They've released four records with a plans for a best of record in the worst. In, in the works, Steve Gorman, uh, who was on here recently, played drums on the first record, and Brad Pemberton from Steve Earle uh, played drums on the other three albums, and it, Brad still plays with these guys today. Joe's written, produced, engineered, mixed, and mastered about 15 albums between himself and Dan Baird, Warner Hodges, and Joe's solo album, which is awesome. It's called uh, Good, Bad, Right or Wrong. It's a very, very, very good record if you're into classic rock. Um, uh, when Dan, uh, for Warner's solo record, uh, he also did much of the graphic design, the photography, and the video editing associated with all the projects. When Dan Baird was diagnosed with cancer, Dan asked Joe to tour with Homemade Sin, which is Dan's other band, while he recovered. And of course, Joe hated the reason why he was doing it, but he loved every minute of being in his like dream cover band. And uh, he call, got to call out a lot of Georgia satellites. And that must have been really cool, no? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, Joe also worked on the chef's new album with Dan, Dan Baird and Stan Lynch. Joe is the secret chef. Uh, and then Dan and Joe formed the hang fires with Greg Morrow, who's also on here. And Jen Gunderman, the great keyboard player from Cheryl Crow's band. The new album is called Curly Q. It just came out. It's a great record. And I'm sure we'll talk about all these things. Now he's, you're involved in so many, how do you keep your own life to get your calendar? What, what must it look like, man? I, I'm confused. And I've just like read this for five minutes. Um, it just, it's just like a, a, a steadily flowing river. You know? <laughs> Project leads into the next one, to the next one, to the next one. Um, I've got a very supportive wife that is a music lover, and she was, uh, you know, dug all these bands and bandmates that I've, you know, been associated with for the last 10 years or so. And it just works out. Very Although cool, it man. is a little louder than she probably expected. Yeah, loud is good, though, with this music. And uh, in case I know people are wondering, it's the state flag of Tennessee, because I asked the same question. It's not Captain America, although it may be Captain America in the next Captain America movie. Uh, all right, man. Hey, thanks for coming on the show, Joe. I appreciate it. I've been looking forward to talking to you. So this is really cool. This is really funny, actually. I, I couldn't believe this. Talk about the fictitious band that you made up as an art student, because when I read that, I'm saying, man, this is like punked taken to the extreme so 
tell me about that. And also talk about how do you get interested in art originally? Because you obviously pretty into it to pursue it uh, educationally. I, I think I, I, I came out d- drawing. Uh, right on. Best I can, can recollect, I've always done some sort of, of art drawing, uh, making my own comic books and, you know, mashing two different styles together and stuff. Anyway, I, um, that was always going to be what I was going to do. And I uh, got into music probably 13, maybe, well, maybe a little earlier than that. And uh, me and my buddy were uh, less, who ended up being the singer in, my, in the first band I was in. We were big into Alice Cooper. And it was everything we could do. If Alice Cooper, Alice Cooper, we bought posters, every album we did, we'd mow grass. As soon as we'd mow grass, we'd buy the records. And then punk rock hit. And we heard the Sex Pistols for the first time and the Ramones and the Damned and the Dead Boys and the Clash. And the next thing you know, it was a, it was more than just being a fan of music at that point, it was like, hey, I think I'd like to do that. I was, I was not a player. I never uh, owned an instrument or learned how to play. I still really haven't learned how to play. No, <laughs> man, don't, play. don't say that, man. You, no, you, no, you're no, ve- no. man that you did that whole album yourself. Well, <laughs> your solo record, man, that's, that was some really good stuff on there, man. If we get to it and there's time, I'll tell you about my one guitar list. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, right on then. Um, but anyway, so we get to high school and, you know, I'm in, I'm in, a, in, a, in I'm a senior in high school and uh, Madison high here in Nashville. And uh, I'm drawing and I make this flyer. I'm not a have I don't own an instrument, an amp, never played a, a note. And I just made up a band, um, included my friends in the band and post dated the, the, the show on the flyer and then I put the flyers up (laughs) and a a few days later people were seeing the flyers and they said why didn't you tell us you were playing we (laughs) want to see you and 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 a lot of them were girls and yeah man it was pretty pretty good And, and so I thought well hell that worked great let's uh pretty good response let's do it again. So this time I did it and I actually drew pictures of each, all of my friends were in each corner. I can remember these things. They're the first one had a guy with a straight jacket. Uh, it looked kind of like, but you. did you, you didn't have a concert? No, no, no. I not, didn't even have a band or any, or anything, but I just tried it again to see what would happen and double the response. So more girls and I, we all, me and my buddies just all went, what's going on, you know? And, and we said, we have to start a band. And so we went and bought instruments within the week and took, I took my first lesson, maybe that first week. Uh, my, my buddy Les, who I was in Dallas Cooper with, he was a, he was a very um, uh, a thrifty guy. And he, his dad was kind of like that. His dad was a wheeler dealer, sold used cars and stuff. So his, he went, he went into the music store. We both went in together and he goes, how much for guitar lessons? We're here to, you know, we're here to do it up. And uh, the guy said, ah, $6. Uh, and for like 30 minutes or something. And Les said, I'll tell you what, I'll give you five for the both of us. <laughs> and he goes, what do you mean? And he goes, well, we'll both take the lesson at the same time. Therefore, you're still giving just one lesson, you know, so he really, we just both take it. And he talked the guy into it somehow. The, I think that he just wore the guy down and, and it was, we, we had a lesson. I think we learned a kiss song. Um, I think we tried to pick what we thought would be the easiest song to learn. Well, we didn't know shit from Shinola. We didn't know how to, how to play. So the guy showed me the E bar chord and I went, so with this chord, I can make all the chords, <laughs> you know, just running them up the neck. Yeah. And he goes, well, kind of, you know, and I went, 
see you. That was hard. <laughs> you know, <laughs> we played our first gigs maybe two months later, um, club gigs, and and to 150, 200 people. And I played my first gigs with the E bar chord and a big can of finger ease because when you, <laughs> when you do that, finger ease, <laughs> you had to spray the neck. It was just dripping off the neck, you know? That's so like funny, man. NW40. Um, but yeah, but we, we were, at, we were, we didn't want any of that learning you know, to get in the way of us. <laughs> yeah, who needs to, you got the whole, you got all the chords, man. You, you don't need to, That's you probably thought idea. to yourself, why are these guys wasting all their time practicing? You just got this whole thing. You got all the chords here. Yep. And after a few months, um, I saw somebody play the A bar chord and that of course, you know, revelation, <laughs> you know, half the, half the space. <laughs> oh my God. So the so how did the concert go? So was any of the guys like had instruments? Were any of them like already playing, or were you all nope. basically starting nope. at zero? We're all all completely uh, non musical people. Not right. no lessons of any kind. No piano lessons as kids. Nothing. Um, we we went to a music store here, and where we all grew up in the same area of Madison, just north of uh, Nashville, and <laughs> so we're so we're just so naive, you know, but we, but know everything and that naive even know everything. We went to the music store and we said, Hey, we're going, we're looking to buy some guitars. And the guy said, well, the best deal we have here is this guy over here. And it was a, it was a Brown Les Paul hanging on the wall. It was doo doo Brown. It was, you know, we wanted, we weren't, we didn't know what a good deal was. Right. 90 bucks, Gibson Les Paul. 19, a legit Les Paul? Yep. 1979. He goes, the, oh. only, the only thing wrong with it, and he picked it up off the wall, he turned it around, and it said like Betty on the, carved in the back of it, you know, big Betty. Of course, I'd kill for a guitar, a name carved in the back of it. Yeah, now, absolutely. Back then, we were going like, we can go buy brand new guitars at JC Penney for $60, which is what we did. Right. And, and so we, so you got like a we, harmony or a Tysco or something uh, global. Okay. Global, uh, which they all probably came from the same place. So, <laughs> sure. you know, action that high. Um, <laughs> some, I got an SG cause you know, Al Alice Cooper guys played an SG. And That's right. It looked like it had some, um, golf grass under the whammy bar of course you can imagine how long it stayed in tune we went back to the music store and you know as, as dumb as we were um we need these tuned <laughs> like like we we're going to get our oil changed <laughs> uh, we need these tuned and they said okay it was how much and these guys said five bucks we said all right you know, so they charge you five bucks to tune your guitar, a bunch of kids? Oh, my God. You know, this is all pre-buying a tuner. You know, you're tuning guitars in 79 was a different thing. It was... I, oh, I yeah, they didn't have a... Strobo, <laughs> Strobocon tuners yeah. and, uh, you know... They didn't have like these little... They didn't, they didn't <laughs> they have these little have, things. didn't have any of those. Even You didn't even really have the little little plug-in thing guys they didn't come yeah. around for a couple of years later so a lot of it was tuning for tuning for it yeah sure yeah. Or, or a really expensive tuner or piano um but <laughs> listen but, I, I can't you could buy this piano and tune your guitar it'll be four thousand dollars <laughs> yeah. we paid, paid our five bucks before we got out the door they were out of tune again of course uh, and of course they, they took pity on us. They knew they'd taken us, but, um, they, they were actually friendly to us after that. They, we learned our Les Paul lesson. That was, yeah. the we paid for it. <laughs> wow. So that's hilarious, man. So then, so after that, was it like in your DNA or like, I got to do this. This is what I want to do. Well, to, we did not connect the dots to get proficient on your instrument, learn, learn how to play. It was, it was, here's the records. 
we um, our bass player Randy he was in he went to Vanderbilt he was like Mensa smart so he, <laughs> scientifically he could figure out how the instruments worked from not from a musical perspective but from a science yeah science you know and and, and so we had that going for us when we first got together we all three played through an amp I bought for 50 bucks that said bass amp. We call it the Acme because it had no brand. You know, it, was, it had no brand in one speaker. I wish I had it today because it probably sounds cool. Yeah. Uh, we all three played on it and I immediately started writing music and we played one of my first songs, my very first song, it's called Kill Me kill me uh, yeah and we 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 still get together like salmon you know going upstream every once in a while we get together and play and we always play that song you play the song kill me. so the, did yeah. the, are these guys musicians as well or they're just hobbyists um they I, well less less is still um plays here and there but he's a lawyer um, oh man why does that not surprise me six bucks um, for an hour Oh, I'll give you five for two. What kind That's of right, math? Right. Fucking uh, math is that? <laughs> Randy, um, Randy was a, um, I think he's retired now, but he's, uh, and he's not old enough to retire. He just, like I said, he was meant so smart. Yeah. <laughs> so he's, <laughs> he got out while he was young enough to enjoy it, I guess. But he's Good for a, him. A, like a, 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 I don't know what you call geology engineer. Uh, he inspected earth dams and things like that. Hmm. Very non-musical music. Yeah. yeah. So you, okay. So you started writing how, and then at what point did you say, Hey man, I, this is what I want to do. Fuck art. Well, I didn't say that until I got out of college um, because really the music thing to me was something really fun to do. we we didn't have to like build up an audience. We started, we got a gig and we had an audience in Nashville. Right, right. It was 300 punk rockers. It was brand new to the scene. So like I said, it's where I met Warner. Um, and so I, so there was no effort in the usual effort to build your band brand and name and get out there and get some people going and playing in front of five people. We started playing in front of 150 people. That's amazing. Um, Did you play at that club that Jason, the punk club that Jason told me he lived behind? Uh, was it Frank at Frankenstein's, which we always call Frankenstein's. I don't remember. I don't remember. So there was no, it wasn't that. It was, There's Cantrells. There, there was only a few. I think it was Cantrells. He lived behind yeah. Cantrells, I think. So we played Frankenstein's and Cantrells, and you know, immediately like all, like REM opened for us. Had Cantrells. REM and, opened for you guys. Yeah, 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 yeah. And 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 then and and also the band. Uh, this is all early stuff. This is all. I was going, I was in college, but I was going to a community college in town so I could still play music, you know, which we did every weekend. I made more money on the weekend playing music than I did all week at my regular job. Um, and then went to school and we never slept, you know, and, and we, we didn't care. It was, we had a ton of fun, but I never thought I was going to be a serious musician. Um, you know, REM opened for us. We thought we were, you know, big shit and, until they played and wiped the floor with us and we had to follow it. Yeah. Uh, they were very, such a nice band, though. They, they, uh, we exchanged, or we'd each put out a 45, a homemade 45. I still have my, I think it's worth about a thousand bucks now. Yeah, I would imagine. Um, and uh, so they came back and we opened for them, you know, graciously, you know, go and play in front of their crowd. It, they were a, fan, a fantastic band. And actually, on that same bill where they opened for us, uh, the Brains were third on the bill. And the Brains were in Atlanta. I believe they were an Atlanta band. But they had um, Rick Price was the guitar player. Uh, which ended up, he ended up being with the bass player in the satellites. 
Okay. Fantastic right. too. You know, they were playing songs like, uh, I think Cindy Lauper had the hit on it. Uh, Tom Gray was their singer. Uh, the thing, things we do for money or something like that. And she had a big hit off. Cindy Lauper had a big hit on it later. That's cool, man. So then you meet it. You met Warner during that time. Right. How did you guys wind up connecting? So Warner would just, you know, I was underage, uh, 17, uh, at, at the club. Um, man, you've known him, a, you guys have known each other a long time. We have. Yeah. Since that's since great. Either late 79 or early 1980. So, that's very unusual. Maybe not so much music, but to have a friend that long is really cool. It is. And we've, you know, it's like, like we've just had these weird little, you know, go away for 10 years and come back for 10 years. And thankfully this time we've stayed together probably for the longest, um, the longest period of time. But so Warner would just come out and see us and he, I didn't even know he played guitar. Um, he was not in any bands at that time. He's, he, we were called Ramones clones because that was the name of the band. No, the rats was the name of the band yeah. with a Z, of course. Um, and we, but we played a lot of Ramones songs, and really that was the stuff we could manage at our talent level. Sure, uh, Ramones was was in our wheel wheelhouse, and I may not have been very good, but I was, I had a fast right hand, and I it just looked like a blur. If you see the pictures of me from that time, it's just a blur, like a fan. And um, Warner would say, man, your hand is so fast. And, of course, I had no idea. <laughs> he was at home, you know, destroying ACDC and, and, and killing it on guitar. Yeah. I had no idea. Our drummer got in Iraq um, a, a few months after meeting Warner and couldn't play several gigs we had booked. And we were looking for a drummer. We needed one, and Warner said, I play drums. I read this in your bio. <laughs> and he didn't play drums. And, and he said, I play drums. And we said, okay, then, you know, you're the drummer. And so he played the next three or four shows with us on drums. I've still oh, cool. got a, a cassette of it somewhere. Oh, so he did he legit play drums. I didn't know that. No, that's what he did as in his uh, parents' band when he played country in Germany. Oh, okay. He played drums. Right, and, right. So he didn't know any of this, and uh, he was uh, he was really good. And of course, we were all into the same music. You know, we were we were you know ACDC was playing. You know, they had just come out with Highway to Hell. We were all all of us were going to the same shows. Cheap Trick. You know, all these early fantastic. Uh, yeah. formations of the bands that we were seeing where they had to close down the Tennessee theater, you know, after ACDC played because it apparently crumbled the foundation. Wow. The place. But the, it was, it's, you know, number one, it's the best show I've ever seen more. That yeah. seen ACD, I've heard that a lot. A lot of guys I've had on the show. That's their favorite show. But Bon Scott, you know, just maybe he probably passed away two or three months after that. But they were at the zenith, you know. They were at the crest at that time. Yeah, it was some good crazy. music they were making, man. Powerful. Powerful. All right, so you know, I thought I would be really uh, not very talkative. Every, let me tell you I something. Like I'm a very, I feel like I'm being a chatterbox. <laughs> let me tell you something. The guys that say, like, I've had guys. You didn't say anything, but I've had a lot of people say, "Look, Craig." I can't talk for 90 minutes. Honest to God, those guys go two and a half hours. Not 90%, 100% of them. And at the end, I'm like, what? I thought you could talk. Well, yeah, I didn't. And I never like put pressure on it because if you can't talk, man, I'm not going to like hold you hostage. You know, it's like organic, you know, if it's good or, or not. But um, no, you're doing great. All right. So you get, okay, you get this. You get signed to A and M with the Royal Court of China. Okay, um, what prompted you to move out to LA and then back to Nashville a couple of years later? So, the Royal Court. Um, when I when I when I got out of school, and I'm just gonna make a real quick transitional story here. When I got out of um, of college, and I didn't graduate. I'm, I discovered at the end of it 
that I was nine hours short. Oh, that's good. I, I, and it was a, you know, I should have gone to see like a guidance counselor or something, but instead I worked two jobs, put myself through school, uh, you know, took a g- giant school, scholastic load. And um, I just couldn't go to school anymore. And yeah. I didn't like what I, what I was studying, uh, which was, I, I loved art. But when you make art, you're just making it for other artists, you know, at, the, at, yeah. a, at a fine art level. It's so your audience is, it, it gets really condensed and very, just highly opinionated. You know, I know music is too, but music is like, you know, it's more primal. Everybody can have fun. Everybody can experience it. And I started going, wow, I get the same thing out of writing songs and performing them as I do make you know doing a creating a painting you know or doing some you know sort of etching or something so i i made the switch and decided i could be an old artist anytime i wanted to nobody would be looked down on me for being an old artist but i if i was going to try to do music i needed to do it while i was young so i decided to write every day and that was going to be the key, right? Just write every day and try to get as, as good as you can writing songs. Um, within a few months, I had a band again. Um, I was, uh, it became the Royal Court of China. We put out a self-produced EP. We got a manager, Grace Reinbold, and uh, uh, we, uh, I think Kim Bowie actually got it to uh, the vice president of A&M Records. Uh, she was working with MCA. I don't know if you know Kim or have heard of her. She's, uh, yeah, I have heard that name. I don't know yeah, why, though. She's been a VP. I think she was VP of Island or maybe even higher. I don't know. I know that she had a – she's worked with tons of huge artists. Um, I think she's done some e- – uh, I'm trying to remember. I'll get it wrong if I remember. Anyway, she was one of our early adopters, if you will, and uh, <laughs> kind of l- listened to our e- EP and basically said, hey, you, you, know, you guys have got something you need to work on <laughs> writing better songs. And I was going, oh, I thought, I, I thought that's what I was doing. Um, but I think she got it to, to David Anderley, who was the VP at a and at the time, and he came to one of our shows in Nashville. Um, it was, we couldn't, they wouldn't let us play the cool places. So we played uh, one really small place called Ellison Square. Why wouldn't they let you play the cool, because you're a punk band? Um, well, we weren't really punk at that time. Really, if I had to classify the Royal Court, we had transitioned into something where we had a guy that was, uh, we had two Led Zeppelin fanatics. The guitar player was, Oscar was a, uh, Richie Blackmore and Stevie Ray Vaughan, you know, playing clean blues through a, a, a twin. I was still a punk rocker, you know, trapped in, in this, which was a gr- kind of glorious mish, mix, mish mashup of these, these different styles. Uh, it kind of made it very special um, with my bandmates, Robert and Chris. And it was, it was cool. It was unlike anything we'd done, but we didn't, we weren't, we couldn't play across the street. So we'd play the little club (laughs) and we finally started packing it out. And all of a sudden, Hey, there's a, there's, it's, it's sold out. There's 150 people outside waiting to get in and the club across the street that wouldn't let us play was empty. Wow. Which is where you want to be. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and then they, of course, came over and asked us to play the, the bigger club across the street, which we did, um, and that was cool. Uh, that's the exit end, very. Um, oh, that well, very f- kind of well known. Yeah, club. well known, really well known. You know, we've seen so many bands there when we're you know starting this stuff. All the you know everybody from the Ramones, the Police, the B52s were all playing there to just. 40 50 people or whatever we were getting like the best introduction to the the new the new wave if you sure uh, but anyway i know very long with you um the so the real court you know we made our first record in nashville and mixed it in la and we really we really loved la um we at the time we had gotten 
um, Stevens White's as our business manager. And he was, he only represented, represented two bands at the time. And that was Led Zeppelin and <laughs> Bad Company. So, and you guys and us, but, uh, so our, our, like I said, we had two Led Zeppelin fanatics in the band and we were so green and, you know, I wish somebody would have taught, you know, I say wish it's all our own fault for not learning, but, um, we could have used some uh, men mentoring or some uh, charm school lessons, I guess, um, as far as what, what was, what we, what the expectations were, but sometimes there's benefits from not knowing what the hell you're doing. Uh, we decided we were going to go to New York and go to visit Stevens Weiss and get him to join our team. Oh, oh so wait a minute. So you didn't, I thought he was your manager. I thought he got assigned. Oh, our manager was Grace Reinbold, um, fantastic lady and great manager. And we, uh, but we were wanted to get the Led Zeppelin stuff on us. So we. So you went to New York. Like, did you have an appointment? We no nothing. We flew to New York. Wow! You're not realizing he might not even be in town. Oh, I mean, this is just this is how dumb and sometimes you know. <laughs> Like I say, if you if you know yeah. what you're doing, you probably wouldn't do it sometimes. Sometimes, so, yeah. It's a beautiful accident. So we uh, we rented a limousine and drove to his <laughs> house, which was just outside of. You drove Miami. to his house. Drove to his house. How did you know where he lived? Like, how did you get his? Like, <laughs> would you look him up in the phone book? I mean, yeah, apparently so. I gotta say. In all honesty, I was along for the ride because I, I didn't, you know, I was more into, I wasn't into Led Zeppelin. Right. I love Led Zeppelin. Who can't love Led Zeppelin? But I wasn't the Led Zeppelin fanatic. Like, yeah. Uh, when Oscar were. And so I just kind of was along for the ride. Hey, New York, limousine. So you rent a limo. There, you know? <laughs> So the guy probably lived out on Long Island or something, right? He lived in a a, a palace. Yeah. Um, you, know, you gotta imagine that's Led Zeppelin money and it was it like, <laughs> Led know, Zeppelin like, money. It looked like the White House. It was yeah. enormous. Um it had it, the, the 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 grounds were huge. It had you know all the stereotypical trappings. It was black uh, gates um dobermans <laughs> you know on the other side of it it was, it was it was it was crazy so we just you know the limo pulls up the finger goes out the window hits the button on the little box you know yeah who is it, <laughs> it oh my god still. this is like shit you, this is like a movie yeah and uh Royal Court of China to see Mr. Weiss. <laughs> wow, well, God, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, uh, A&M Records, Royal Court of China. <laughs> well, that was dull out a little bit more information, you know, some more credentials and uh, Royal Court of China. Okay, and then let us in. And we spent the next few hours listening to, you know, quarter inch tapes, reel to reel tapes of Led Zeppelin outtakes. That is, you know, crazy stuff, you know, it was, uh, and, and he ended up being our business manager. Um, well, you know what, man, I, how could you say no to a bunch of kids that put that much effort into something? Honestly, that's like, so, you know, look back now, if someone did that with you now, you'd be like, yes, I'm happy to work with you. <laughs> you would i mean just because you know and the royal court of china which i, I we really didn't even know i mean I, I didn't pick out the name um that was supposed to be the name of the firm oh so, does the the um Robert, jimmy jimmy page uh, and, uh project and, uh, with, uh, uh chris chris farlow no um the singer for Oh, bad company. Yeah. Um, Paul Rogers. Paul Rogers. Yeah. Yeah. So they were going to call their band the Royal Court of China, but apparently Royal Court of China has some sort of heroin 
you know, it's like a slang for some sort of heroin. I didn't do drugs. I, I still don't, but um, might start. But, There's always time. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, but anyway, that they were supposed to call themselves that. And I think, so I think we just kind of lifted the name. It wasn't in use and got it. Uh, I think Paul Rogers tried to use it and contacted Please. Stevens later when we, of course, he had licensed it for us. You know, <laughs> he had to explain that. Let me ask you a question about, uh, I was wondering when you said you left art, are you a social guy? Uh, I, 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 I am, but I'm not, it's not natural. If you've, um, I'm sure you know, in your line of work, you may have taken a Myers-Briggs a oh, personality yeah. thing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> many, many, many. You know, Scary. Too, and I am, um, I think I'm an ENTJ, which you, that's kind of expect, I, something to be expected, but I am one tick from extrovert to introvert. Okay. You know, I'm one tick over the line. So I, am, I can be social, but I really want to just sit there and let the party come to me. Gotcha. Rather than, and I, so I'm not a very good schmoozer. Like Warner is fantastic at it. You know, he goes in, he can shake hands, he, whether he likes it or not, I don't know. But he's, he's fantastic. And I know he, he I just, that's just not in my personality to do it. I don't think sure. it is Dan's either. We've had discussions on it. Uh, Reason I ask is because I'm, I'm wondering, you know, when you do art, it's a very isolated creative um, endeavor. When you do music in a band, especially, it's, it's not isolated at all. It's extremely interactive. So I was curious if that was one of the things that the, the attractions that drew you into music over, over. Well, the, the, the attraction is not that people are there to see me. My, and it still is to this day, the attraction is they like what we're creating. No, I meant you like creating with other guys in the band. I meant with working with other band members, not like with an audience. Well, and, and that's true. But if you think about, and I, you know, I write, I'm a, you know, my primary, I'm usually, usually the lead singer, you know, or, or yeah, somewhere in the middle and usually the, the songwriter or have had a lot to do with it. Yeah. So that means I'm holding the brush, you know? And so all these other things are colors, not that I control it all. Yeah. But if you look at it like that, I'm going, wow, I, you know, I came up with a, a song and, and I, I painted it well enough that people are enjoying it or they clapped afterwards. So, okay. you know, they, 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 they validated the work was good, at least whether it was, I'll give it a 10, you can dance to it. I don't know. You know, so you just had a different, you, you liked music and your mindset was this, it's art, just a different canvas. Correct. Yeah, man. That's cool. Correct. That's interesting. All right. So this guy becomes your manager, which is like, a pretty cool story, actually. Uh, what? Why did you go to LA after that, and then what? What made you move back? So when we when we made our second record, um, we recorded it. We wanted to get the hell out of Nashville. We had, you know, we're all from Nashville. We recorded the first record in Nashville. We got to go to LA to to mix it, and then we went. Wow, LA's great. Now we've done some touring and stuff and seen lots of different places we'd never been to before as well on the first record. But the second record, we got to spend two months out there. Um, and we were staying at a place called Franklin Plaza Suites, which is uh, at the time, all the record companies put their incoming recording bands in the same um, they're like it's like a hotel, but it's really apartments. So yeah, it's so it's like long-term, yeah, like business yeah, residence. Compound, right yeah. down to, you know, right in the midst of Hollywood. 
um, you know, secure, you know, people are coming through a gate and all this kind of stuff. And we, we had, it had, I think it rained every day for three months in Nashville. When we got to LA, it was beautiful every day. Yeah. Of course, you know, every, everything about it was just a, a, a appealing. Um, we got to record at Sound City. Oh, know? wow. And, and all, everybody, you know, all your favorite artists and records are up on the wall. You're passing them as you're going in. You're going, yeah, that's going to be me. They're going to have to take that one down, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, make room for me. Um, and it, everything about it was fantastic. And when we got back, it was just like, wow, we're back. Back in Nashville, <laughs> wasn't it great in LA? So you know, my neighbor in LA was Flava Flav. That's so funny. Uh, worked for two months. I never understood a word he said, and we talked. About it. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I was going to ask you too. You said that you never did drugs. How did you es like escape that? Like, cause that's you were coming up in a day where that was like the norm, not the exception. Well. I guess I just say I was just plain damn scared of them, you know. I just wasn't something that I that I wanted to do. Um, you know, I'm like everybody else. I, you know, <laughs> I can't, there's, there's this comedian that I really love. There, <laughs> the uh, oh my gosh, you, I have to give you the link. You, if I tell the joke, I, I'm a, the world's. Uh, I'm just not very funny joke teller. Everybody says I got this really corny sense of humor. And I don't know what, where they get it from, but you know, of course you can see I was prepared. Yeah, actually prepared. Yeah, <laughs> man. That's a, that's a first. I hope Dan spit out his coffee. If he watches this, you know, this is a first man. You actually <laughs> pulled out an ear of corn. Probably. Yeah, man. But, um, you know, I just wanted, and not that I didn't do my share of, um, beer drinking, you know, to major excess, but that was just kind of, I guess the, it's as far as I really w wanted to go. With. Yeah. That's really interesting. Yeah. It's, it's good that you didn't enough. understand flavor of flavor you know, because that's bad enough. If you, go, if you take it, you know, too, too far. Yeah. Flavor of flavor must've been stoned all the time. I would imagine. So we, me and, uh, me and Drew, uh, the bass player, we had a couple of bass players in the Royal court. We were in a hot tub with Flava Flav. This is all on premises of the, the Franklin Plaza Suites and Babyface. <laughs> which I can't remember Babyface's real name. He's, you know, he's, uh, he's a gigantic producer. Now, they, both yeah. of these, you know, Flava Flav was, was famous, but you got to, this is probably 1989, maybe. <laughs> I get your baby face's name because I can't think of it. It's bothering me now. And uh, Edmonds, baby face Edmonds, but I don't. <laughs> anyway, he you know went on to he had giant hits and stuff. But we were all in a hot tub. It was me, it's two, two, me and True, <laughs> baby face and Flava. Flav was in his swim trunks with a big you know, his big clock. So you had the clock on even in the hot tub. I, Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, it was never left without the clock. Um, had the clock in, and uh, I think his name's T I want to say his name's Terry. Kenny. Anyway, he said. Kenny. Kenny. Kenny Edmonds. Record, I'm doing my first record, and I'm not. He didn't. I, he didn't sound like that. You know, that's that's just the voice I'm giving him. He said, I'm, I was worried. He said, I'm doing my first record and, you know, you guys have been in the business and we were like, oh man, we were drinking champagne. You know? <laughs> in and the he hot was worried about his first record coming out and being mm. successful and all that. And we were just like, man, you know, don't worry about it. I'm sure it'll be great. You know, <laughs> and just yeah. st straight up. And then of course became a fantastic producer. Yeah ton of other people so that's wild what a story man well my career is really not not so much a career but a series of near misses and close calls no, but that's pretty that's how many people that is so wild that you're sitting down there hanging out with flavor flav he's such a character man 
Oh, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to move back out there was because it was, that was the, that was a great, that was a world we kind of really enjoyed being in. So, so you moved back out to LA much better yeah. weather, of course. And you know, you got to hang out there. Any culture shock living there coming well, from little no, town it's, outside of Nashville? It's great. But the real, the, the reality check came from, um, well, everything about it was beautiful, except for the fact that the, you know, they had to extend the, the news an extra hour to get all the murders in. <laughs> you know, at this time it was gangbang territory. You know, yeah. there some bloods. It was, it was, it was, it was really a violent. There was kind of dangerous around in in Hollywood during that time, and sure. Uh, graffiti on everything. That was a big culture shock to us. We didn't really care, but um, uh, the we 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 also went out there because we went. Wow, let's be close to the record label, right? And let's just kind of be close to the biz. But in reality, the biz wants to be away from the biz. <laughs> so they want to. They'd much rather come to you in your environment and see your, you know. To them, Nashville was probably a, you know, a really interesting, you know, microcosm of country mixed with, uh, you know, just look at what the Scorchers did. And it's just a mixing of, well, think about that whole area, Memphis, and it all, they're always mashed, blues and, and whatever else they can yeah. find together. And they just created this fantastic stuff. And here we were trying to run the other direction. We should have embraced a little more, but hey, you know, live and learn. So what happened with the band? Because you obviously had some good advisors. You had A&M behind you. What happened? The same old stuff, but it's, it's, uh, the, the hard reality is, is that 90 plus percent of bands that get a record deal don't make it. Right. And that's a huge majority. And so it's not, a, I didn't, we didn't have a hit, you know, right. I, I guess I could put that on me, you know, for not write, writing one, you know, maybe trying to learn how to write, um, be a better songwriter. At that point, we kind of had some juice and some power. And whenever you have that and you, you know, you travel in style, we were traveling with Cheap Trick and Joan Jett. We touring for months with those. Is that where you met Eric? Uh, no, um, Eric was not in the black hearts at that time. Okay. It was, he was before that. I think so. Yeah. 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 This was during the album, the I hate myself for loving you. Album. Oh, that's quite a ways. Yeah. So, um, and this was cheap trick. We're back on top hmm. uh, with the flame. They had just put out and Tom Peterson had just rejoined the band. So we toured with each of those for about three months. Um, and that was fantastic, you know, experience for us and probably the best touring experience until, you know, later when I would, you know, go on the road with Warner and, and Dan and the Bluefields. Sure. So you came back to Nashville, you got a publishing deal. And then you said in your bio, you got a couple of minor album cuts, but most important, you learn how to better connect with the listener instead of writing songs about your bad dreams. <laughs> so explain what that means and like maybe the personal growth that you got out of that. So it was, it was kind of a reset for me because you know, when, when the Royal court disbanded and I moved back to Nashville um, you're faced, I was faced with, with one fear of having to do something else, right. besides music, you know, get a, get a plug back into real life. I'd had a taste. I wasn't ready to, you know, leave the table. Yeah. Sure. Um, and, and also just, uh, when you're, when you keep working for me, I am don't not speaking globally for everybody else, but for me, I was, I was feeding on myself. I was, uh, I kept on trying to write and working really hard at it. 
Um, and what I was pumping out was songs that were like sick of it all. <laughs> Rock and roll's been done to death, you know, and all these cheery subject matter songs. So that was what was coming out of me. And I didn't even notice it at the time. I was just going on being provocative and, and, and creative and, and angst and all that. But really it was um, de depressing. Um, for me. And so when I got back to Nashville, I, I got a big dose of, wow, you know, what are you going to do now? Um, I actually, when the band got dropped from A&M, I was offered a solo deal. Um, and I didn't take it because I was all for one, one for all with the band. And that's that I, I like that about me. You know, I was, yeah. I was loyal and I thought we were all in the fight together it, it, in, in retrospect. It's not a very smart business decision on my part, but I'd been fighting a, we're going to make you the next John Cougar melon camp. That was what was, was said to me. You know, when you talk about all those label deals on the table, everything would sound good. They would throw a, quarter million dollars i'm not exaggerating a check for two hundred fifty thousand dollars on the table and of course we're going oh wow that's pretty good <laughs> we're gonna make you the next john cougar melon can now when you got three other guys sitting in your in your band hearing that that's not very good you know that's not a very good message you know unless everybody's on board with you know <laughs> supporting John Cougar Mellencamp yeah and uh and from my, and really I honestly I, I didn't think of myself like that if I I'm a very slow learner because as I go with the blue fields and all this other stuff I think I'm much closer to something like that than, and maybe they saw that in me at the get-go and I just you know didn't see it in myself but um anyway so I come to Nashville and I decided well I'm going to be trying to get another record deal. And of course, country at the time was, you know, taking off. Sure. And Garth Brooks was bashing, breaking guitars like Kiss and swinging from a rope. And, and I'm going, Oh, wow. Country's more like rock and roll. Um, maybe I should try to write some of that stuff. Um, Sorry. Man. And okay. so I did. And I took, uh, uh, always been interested in recording. I always made my own demos and, and stuff and, and took some demos to uh, uh, Ronnie Millsap's publishing company and gave them the tape and they said, well, we'll get back to you. And I went home. And <laughs> when I got home, I got a phone call. And apparently the, the song plugger which is what they call people that pitch songs to artists, or at least they did back in the day, hmm. uh, had gone to meet a, with an artist and play them some songs from the catalog and had struck out with what they came with. Reached into her purse and pulled out my tape and just put it in and played. And they put the song on hold. So you had a, you had given her a demo with some songs on yeah, there. She had a tape, but she put it in there. I mean, hey, she was trying to win. Yeah. But she got, but they they put on hold a song by from a guy they did not have under contract, which put me in a pretty good position. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so how did you take advantage of that, or did you not? I just uh, they they gave me a good deal. They knew, okay. they, they believed in me that that was a a big. Um, a plus for them to have it right out of the box and they thought they could groom me as a country artist or at least a an edgy that's kind of a dangerous word but they were kind of looking at ooh country's going to get more like classic rock and that's a that was probably a pretty good presumption at the time because you had you know grunge killed hair metal sure at that sure. time uh, country and rap were taking what was left mm -hmm. and there was no, and, and, and I guess maybe the biggest rock band at the time was the black crows and what were, and they were making brand new classic rock. Yeah. You know, I mean, uh, very well. And, and, and I'm a gigantic fan, 
but they um, they were kind of I think people in country were going trying to maximize that kind of vacuum that was left by where's the rock Where, where's the classic rock yeah you know? it's gone it's all it's all moved off in another area a big shift so so they saw you as a good fit to like yeah, segue into that yeah something like that. and they set me up with a lot of great writers i won't i won't remember all their names most of them had number ones in their catalogs um they uh they basically when i would bring an idea they go oh, that's good and then they say but you've got you're writing from past present you, your tenses are moving all around. You're not guiding them through the story. It was, um, it's very disconnected. And as far as the way I was telling my story, it didn't, I wasn't thinking about how the story was, should be told in order for somebody to follow it. Sure. It's really, I'm just going, ah, I'm making it up. I'm rhyming and I'm going to sing it. So who cares? You know, but then I'm, as a songwriter, you really might not be singing the song. So you really need to care. You know, you need right. to hear that way too. So anyway, it made me a better songwriter, although I didn't reap loads of success from it. If you, you know, steal this, um, steal this from Bob Dylan, I watched the, um, what is the, 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 the documentary Rolling um, Thunder or Rolling something Thunder, yeah. where somebody interviewing him saying, Hi, you know, this, this tour is not a big, success is it how would you say it was a success and he goes you know well not if you measure in terms of money <laughs> then i it, it's not a success but for the other things that i wanted to do with it it, it is a success right so I, I love that quote um not very coin operated so that kind of that kind of stuff strikes me yeah because it wasn't a success monetarily but all the other things you wanted to learn about writing it was successful Yep. And I'm yeah. a slow learner. I mean, very, admittedly so. A lot of those lessons appear later. Um, they, I had to absorb them, you know, because I was changing my whole, uh, changing as a, a, an artist, you know, it was, a, it's, sure. it was a big shift. Yeah, from being in a world court, now you're in Nashville writing country music. That is a big change. All right, so... You ran away to Florida. We'll skip that because it doesn't end well whenever anybody comes here to Florida. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you wound up meeting, you, then you moved back to Nashville and you wound up meeting Dan and you formed the Bluefields and it's a nice relationship. You've been working together ever since. I know you saw the satellites in concert when they first came out and you loved the band. What was going through your mind when you're sitting there like working with Dan early on, that's got to be like some hero shit. Like, holy crap, I can't believe this. So the first Satellites record, you know, we saw them at Cantrell's. Um, and it's kind of like the, the, the first two Scorchers records. They're, for me, very formative. Um, I went, wow, that's what, that sounds right. It's got all the energy that I want out of punk rock, but there's something about, I mean, listen to the way I talk. I can't escape it. I mean, I, you know, I could, I could try, but I'm going to talk with a twang. Until yeah. No one's going to accuse oh, you of coming from New York for sure. That's right. So, yeah, man. You know, uh, so all of that stuff kind of fit for me and mainly all the energy behind it. Um, guys from Nashville and it was, it wasn't just, you know, me and, and, and those bands, but in that area, you, you play, you, the, there was not a lot of people standing still on stage. Right. They had way more akin to, uh, you know, taking the, the power stance of Johnny Ramone, you know, or Steve Jones with a, a sneer. Well, we're, we are coming we're, it's it's not an attack, but it might it could turn into that. Sure, you know it was with a de deliberate uh, thrust at you, not 
watch how great I play my instrument. It was aggressive, man. Aggressive, not in an aggressive, it was aggressive energy, not aggression. You know, it was, it was, yeah, very much so. And so, you know, seeing this, when the satellites came on, you know, and I, the same stage as, you know, as within maybe a week, the replacements had been on the stage and maybe about the same amount of people for both shows, about, about 50, you know? Right. Um, and with the replacements, I will, I love the replacements. Um, but after three songs, which where they were the best band in the world, they turned into the worst band in the world. <laughs> you know, with the satellites, it was one, two, three, hit the button, the world detonates and doesn't stop until they leave. Yeah. And you hadn't closed your mouth the entire time, you know? Um, just, just perfect in every way. Uh, so when, when Dan, um, came over, I really was hoping he would keep coming over. I think was my, my first thing. Will he like this? Will he, I was nervous about it. And Dan was, Dan was kind of nervous. He was still smoking at the time. He was taking a lot of smoke breaks and, and, but he, we just started talking and he was talking about something that Keith Christopher had said. And I said, that's our song. And he looked at me and he goes, thank you for listening. Let's go write a song. That's cool. We man. Writing, and we wrote a song. Um, and then I don't think I saw him for a couple of weeks after that. He came back, Warner brought him back and I brought in, uh, a song called Bad Old Days, which was the first song that we did. It's the Blue Fields. And Dan went, ah, you know what we're going to have to do now? we got to start a band. And I was like, really? <laughs> awesome. And so that was, that was really cool, man. So it was, yeah. uh, that's, that's, so it was like you got to play with one of your musical heroes. Yeah. Who you're now good friends with for a long time. I, I think between him and Warner, they're they're my best friends. Um, um, they're it's, uh, they're always either over here or we're always talking. That's uh, great, man. That's great, and you're all musically super compatible, which is like you know very apparent in all the stuff you've done. Uh, in your bio, you mentioned that you would have never believed the best years of your music career would start in your 40s. How do you look at that today? in terms of your life in general, or in terms of how you look at life in general? Uh, I think, and uh, I, I'm not overly philosophical about things because, and I, and I think maybe I, maybe I was used to be more when I thought little things mattered more than they, they actually, they actually do in the long run there. It just things don't matter as much. <laughs> um, they, they, they take on a great deal of weight um, just from our fears and, and we, we give the, we give these kind of insignificant significant things a lot of additional weight when we don't need to. We can just be easier people. I'm, and again, I'm not speaking globally, but I'm just speaking about myself. Yeah, for yourself, sure. I handle stuff. I would get out of the box. I get, uh, I, I'm guarantee almost every band except for the Bluefields and hopefully not the, the Bluefields. Somebody's called me a, a tyrant or a dictator, you know? <laughs> and that was just my way of getting stuff done. And it doesn't mean it was right, but. Um, That's like, uh, really surprising because i don't get any of that energy so you either save it for work yeah but you <laughs> but but your energy is very like stable man um i mean we're I, all working on shit believe me sure sure and i think that um the older i get the the more i learn and i'm not, not very good at this but i'm trying I learned, I, I try to listen a little bit more. Um, 
than be the guy that has all the ideas, has all the answers. Um, I, I, I don't. I might think I do, but I don't. Uh, and I need, I need uh, the input of others, and I need, and I need help with things. Um, oh, okay. It's very difficult for me to admit that mm. um, and at times is very, very hard, but I'm getting better at it. And I also, I'm much better as a part of, as a team member. Right. Than I am as a, as a, that whole, the whole team, you know? Now I understand why you sent me that note about, we had some stuff in common when you said the help, it's tough to ask for help. It is. Yeah. It was very, I love that about your uh, your interview setup. Uh, I don't think I've ever had anybody interview me that actually gave me some information about themselves. I think it's a it's a wonderful um, tool for having a conversation with somebody. You don't immediately you go, ah, I kind of know this guy. You know? <laughs> Thank you. you know, it's, a, it's different. Thank you it's very fun. much. That's you know, really, really kind of you direction thanks man that's kind of you i appreciate that i just don't want someone to think i'm a dick without giving me a chance to be a dick you know <laughs> and when i might be but give me a give me the open platform you know yeah. to level the playing field <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but you know you can shorten that <laughs> uh thank you for answering that that was kind of you to say thanks man uh, Joe, tell me about Underground Treehouse Records because uh, you've you've done a lot with it now. And how did that start? And what made you start it? And what do you enjoy most about it? Well, ever since I walked into the very my very first pro recording session, I have been mesmerized with recording. Um, as soon as I saw my first large console, I went. That I, I love everything about that. It, it would be impossible for me to learn it. And the engineer goes, "Hey, you see this? See this one channel? This one line from top to bottom? That's all you need to learn. Just the one. It's all. It's you know at that time, however many it was, thirty-two of of the same thing. Just learn the one thing, and it's thirty-two of those. And I was like." Uh, but uh, isn't that cool when someone breaks something down like that to you it's almost like uh magic it, that i have applied that little lesson uh through a, a bunch of different instances in my life a way to go ooh don't worry it's kind of the way people that aren't like uh, naturally mathematic can do complex math problems quickly is if they frame it differently you know there's there's ways to do the math yeah there's right. ways of looking at it that right you break it down really simply and you go ah i, I know the answer right right uh, but anyway so with underground treehouse it's all been from that day um when when i was with a m when i lived out in la they were going to cut a bunch of my songs at a m studios which is one of the best studios in town at least it was then um and they were i said well how much does that cost <laughs> they were going to send them to some artists and stuff. And I went, how much does that cost? And they told me, and I said, well, I could buy my own rig. You know, at the time it was an eight track. Sure. Boss X and a mixing board and some microphones and stuff. And then you can get unlimited amount of songs from me. You won't just get three or four. You'll get as many as you want. That's to me, it was, it was, same as playing guitar. It was so you convinced them to. <laughs> did you convince them to get you the rig? They they gave it to me. Awesome. Uh, they gave it to me. The guy that uh, that engineered our first record, uh, John Mills. He worked with Quicksilver Messenger Service. Wow. And he was the guy that kind of put together the the little system. And he said, "You've got better stuff than they had when they were making." you know, serious albums. As far as the amount of tracks and stuff like that, he showed me mic placement techniques and it was just a few hours later and I was making music. I, 
I actually have one of those machines again and uh, uh, that Drew gave me a few years ago. And it's, I've got pulled out my tapes and listened to them and, and they sound great. That's now, cool, they, man. They shouldn't, but they still, they still sound great. But Underground Treehouse, anyway, I've always been in recording my own stuff uh, and other people's. When, I'm, when I ran away to Florida, one of the things I did was open a recording studio. Where, where, where uh, were I you? I recorded everybody. Uh, every band that came through and near anywhere near the Tallahassee to Panama City area came through my studio. And I learned, you know, either they paid me and I got better gear. If they couldn't pay me, I put them through hell and learned something from, yeah. from them and, uh, and, and did a lot. Of, I learned a lot. So when I got back to Nashville and met, you know, reconnect with Warner and, and Dan, I was set up. I had great gear um, and, and some chops. So uh, Underground Treehouse, named by Dan. He basically, we were in my basement in, in the Bluefields neighborhood, which Dan went, why don't we just call ourselves the Bluefields? So Dan named both of those. Um, and it's just become a little cottage industry, you know? We just put out stuff. It's all in-house. Um, uh, I, I do everything from the graphics to the photography to the mixing, the mastering, the writing the production and we've had um we've had uh tom peterson in here uh from cheat trick elizabeth <laughs> cook um oh, a lot of there's been there's a lot more i just can't think of right now i'm terrible i'm just so glad they invented the word dude <laughs> you know, with names i just can't recall them quickly uh, dude. you <laughs> seem most confident, dude. You seem most confident. Hey, man, why do you think I have your? Why do you think I have your name at the top of the sheet here? Uh, you seem most confident of all the things you've discussed about about recording. Like that. That's your. Is that your true? It it is. It yeah. is. But I do end up playing or singing on a lot of this stuff too, and writing the song. So. I'm, what I get to do is I don't have to, you know, financially, I don't have to worry about paying somebody else to do it. So as many songs as I care to write or sing or play on or my buddies, we don't, we are free yeah. of the financial obligations of getting someone else to do it. And what that makes is that is, is how much time do you want to spend on it? We typically don't spend eons on something because we don't, we just, we got a really great chemistry. But when you don't have to worry about time with when money's attached to it, the, the, pre, the pressure's off. Yeah, it frees you up, man, to focus on music you and make a mistake. A lot yeah. of times, mistakes are the, some of the best things about a, a song. Sure. But, but, we, but you, when you're not afraid of making a mistake, you've made more of them. Yeah. So there, it opens the door to having, having that uh, happen more often. Uh, you, grew, you're, you grew up in Nashville, or you said a little town just north of Nashville? Well, it's na it was still Nashville. It's just a, it, you know, they divide everything up into neighborhoods here. Yeah. So basically, I'm a Nashville guy. Born in that, born in downtown Nashville. That's amazing. Not many of, not many of you. Nope. <laughs> There's a lot more of us now. A lot oh yeah. What was growing up there like? What was your childhood like for you? Um, to me, it it felt normal. Mm. Um, it was. Uh, I didn't know how poor I was. Um, and much to the uh, credit of my mom and my, my family, um, my, my extended cousins and aunts and uncles and stuff, but we were a single parent family. Um, just my mom, she had a really small, like secretarial type job, two kids, no dad, um, no financial support from said no dad. And so she was doing it all on her own. I don't know how she did it. It's so um, tough, man. We, and then we're not like a big, warm, lovey-dovey family because really 
there are no vacations when you do that stuff. You're mm. working on your vacations because you want two checks. Right. Every little bit counts. Um, but I had, I don't think she ever really cared for my music or thought it was very good, uh, but she was very supportive of my art abilities. So, you know, it was, but little things that I didn't, I didn't know that were, you know, maybe abnormal or whatever, but hey, you're going to want to drive soon. I have one car. I got to go to work. If you want a car, you're going to have to buy it. These were right. all matter of fact things like basically, but, but it was like, really, I can get a job, you know? Yeah. Today it would be such a like, Oh no. You know, you know what? I think that's <laughs> normal. Like my kids, I have three kids. I was the only parent that did not buy them a car. I told those kids when they were young, I said, you're going to want a car. Start saving your money. We will match you dollar for dollar, whatever you put away until you're 16. And then you get what you get on that. And they all pissed and moan and bitch. Everybody's parents buying them a car. I said, good for them, man. You can go live with them. See if they can get one. And, uh, you know, of course, later they said, hey, I understand why you did that. But, man, it was hell to pay. That's a no To me, that's normal. I think people buying kids cars are like, you know, you buy them an eight hundred dollar old Datsun, sure, but sure, nowadays, it. yeah, <laughs> nowadays that's not good enough. You know, you need like a, like a either a new Honda or a you know, an aging BMW, and I'm not down with any of that shit to be honest with you, man. I, my first car was a 1973 explodable Pinto. There you go, Pinto. <laughs> that's perfect. Yellow. It That's looked, perfect. It looked and was the same color as a lemon. I bought <laughs> uh, my first lead singer's dad, the guy who did the car, the Wheeler Dealer guy. Right. Um, paid fifteen hundred dollars for it. I crashed it fourteen times. Of course. I saved it. I saved up the money when I was fifteen, and paid cash for it mm -hmm. two weeks before my sixteenth birthday. And that's to me, that was, that was on all normal. Um, I didn't know. I, I just didn't know. I didn't feel. I, I never wanted, I never went without. Sure. Things. And I always, but I always worked for it. Right. You know, I just didn't think, I thought that's just what you did. Mm. You know? um, yeah. That's another thing. I started working early 14. Yeah. You know, I was um, at 10 years old. I was barely big enough to push a lawnmower. And, but at that time I started cutting everybody's yards around the neighborhood. And by the time I was 12, I had several contracts <laughs> with property owners at 12 to mow dozens and dozens of yards. Oh, so you were like a, 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 land, a, uh, a landscape yeah. company, like a it property management. A gas can and a lawnmower and I always had money in my pocket. Yeah, right. I get you. Man. As many comic books as you wanted to buy, you know. Right. I, 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 but, but you know, my mom couldn't do that. You know, sure. she wasn't gone, and I knew it, and that was okay. But that's what allows you now to like not think twice about. Oh, we need some graphics. I'm pretty good at graphics. Let me do that. <laughs> it is. There's a big DIY spirit that comes from that, and I guess yeah. punk and yeah. and the new the new musical landscape, you know, sure. music production landscape. I'm, I fit right in. Yeah, you, know? you really do. Uh, what were some of the low points, Joe, or dark periods you've had to deal with and how'd you get through them? Uh, I think that, um, you know, I, I pers personally, I've not had that many. I've, I've been divorced. Nobody wants to get, you know, that's no fun for anybody, but right. on the other end of that, I got married again and, and it's a, it's fantastic. So sure. that's all great. Um, but I've been, I've been a pretty, I've been pretty lucky and I don't want to jinx it, you know, but I've had pretty good health. Awesome. And I think having that um, and the, maybe the, the work ethic, have always had something to do where I've had enough, you know, financial resources to, you know, have a, a, a pretty sat satisfactory life. Um, I don't, I'm not complaining about yeah. it. Um, 
And so on that front, I just think I'm kind of lucky. I hate that because I feel like the other shoe, I don't hate it. I love it. But <laughs> but I feel like I'm not worthy of the of, of not like it's a joke it's or something. something. The, 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 the bad news is going to come around any second. Yeah. And why is, why is somebody else getting sick? Why, you know, at my age, I'm 58. Um, you start getting the news about, oh, yeah. um, it's ha it's been very close to me with Dan, but, but you, but I got, I just had a friend pass away. The other day, he was in a band. He lived in my neighborhood, in that that poor neighborhood in in uh, Nashville. He was. We were both small kids. He was in a um, a band on Roadrunner called Intruder, and Roadrunner Records was a big kind of thrash metal label uh, back in the day. I think they were. They might have been New York or LA based. I'm not sure. But they for that genre, they were on. They were, you know, they had a, a good record deal. But so we both came out of that neighborhood and he, and he just passed away um, smart, maybe smart. a week or week ago. So that, that happens. And um, we're not guaranteed any more time. So um, trying not to take it for granted. I'm also going, don't get bent out of shape about stuff because <laughs> You know, it's uh, even even if you have a nice long life, you're it's still going to end. You know, <laughs> it, it it is going to end. Um, um, I I think it's low points or for me are just uh, mainly fear based on not you know putting undue. Uh, expectations on myself i need to work harder i need to have progressed further in order to get ahead i've got to run faster now um, you know i'm you're not blessed with loads of talent so what's going to make up for that is work is 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 the the work ethic is going to make up the difference those are <laughs> that's a that's a, that's a blessing and a curse. curse. It, it is, and but it's a lot of pre pressure um, that's unnecessary, you know. Dude, totally on that, totally unnecessary, and it's like awful because yeah. I've suffered from that for most of my life, and in the last year or two, I've really, maybe three years, I've really, really, really worked hard, and honestly, it's paid off because it. Like I just find myself just being kinder to myself. I'm like, man, I have no problem being kind to someone else. Why the fuck do I have such a tough time being kind to myself? And I, and, and now I, I recognize when I am being kind so I can sort of like take a snap, an emotional snapshot, say, Hey man, this feels pretty good. Just keep that. Remember that and then do it again. I understand exactly what you're talking about, man. And it's why I've been the same with work ethic because like, you know, give me that tough project. I'll get it. Well, that's not sure. stupid. There's a drive that comes with it. That's very, you can, you can get shit done, yeah. you know, and, and, and it takes that it's an, it's an, it's necessary in a lot of situations. It's a, it's really great and handy. You know, hmm. if you're, so if you're going to be like a, a full-time musician, you, you better be a damn good part-time carpenter. Yeah. Because right. <laughs> there's yeah. going to be times when you got to, you know, you got to put some, some money on in, the, in your pocket. Yeah. Yeah. But the thing is like, I don't know if you did this for me, I found out I was gravitating to situations that were so unrealistic, the likelihood of, of, of doing something without this Herculean effort was zero. And I, and I, for me anyway, that was because I had this, uh, well, I got to have to work like an animal to do shit. That's ridiculous for me. Anyway, I was like, I need to stop that, man. I need to just pick something I'm happy with. And to be honest with you, in reference to that, this show is the first thing I ever did. Wow. 
because I was, I wanted to just, I thought it would make me happy. And it has, and I've gotten way more out of this than like, if it ended today, I, this has been a, a tremendous return on, on investment of, of time and energy, but it's very funny how that all came to be. I was just talking to a um, um, guitar player in the Royal court, Oscar Rice. He came up, we had not, I don't think we've spoken in a long time, not anything big, but he's, we just don't keep in touch very often. He just called me up and said, Hey man, um, we just, I think we had a conversation we'd never had but in the middle of it. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, he said, I'm hooked on this, this podcast show called everyone loves guitar. <laughs> this was two days ago. That's weird. Yeah. I got goosebumps. That's weird. <laughs> I went, he goes, it's fantastic. And he goes, I get it. I, I love, I hear things because so, so it's got a lot of length on it. You get a lot more in depth stuff. Um, he, he totally digs it. And I said, well, I'm doing mine on Monday. He goes, what? <laughs> I said, you know, when you think of guitar, that's so funny. You know, Joe Bland. That absolutely. Who doesn't <laughs> man? Are you out of your mind? Who doesn't think of Joe Bland? <laughs> Thank you. That was cool. I, you know, it's funny when I hear that stuff, it blows my mind because I see numbers. It's probably like when you make a record, you know, it's, people are buying it or, but, but when you meet someone that, and all of a sudden you're like, Oh man, I love this record. Really? It's, it's like a weird, you know, yep. in a very happy, you know, childlike way, kind of, you know, it's just good to know, like uh, that something I'm putting out there is giving somebody else good vibes. You know, it's like, wow, that's, cool that's rewarding it's a great your your format's great it's different uh, um, oh man this, this is your let's interview off, man okay. let's get off of me all right. uh all right so let me ask you this um this will be good what are what are one or two particular things you've done which at the time were out of your comfort zone but they turn you did them anyway and they turn into big breakthroughs for you all right. Um, so, and I know we, we went past it when I ran away, mm -hmm. Florida. <laughs> Why'd you run away to Florida? I, uh, I felt like I had was beating my head against the wall. I, you know, I was not achieving the success, um, that I ho had hoped for at the time when I first started this, all this music business mess, I didn't, all I want to do is how do you play Kentucky? I'm telling you, that was the, the, the grand, the grand vision was get, how do we play outside of Nashville? We didn't think about record deals. We didn't think about any of that, you know, no world domination, no, no, nothing. It was how do we play somewhere else and take this music to them? So when we got a record deal, and the dream kind of came true. <laughs> um, you don't really know, you're not, I'm, you're not, I wasn't prepared for it. Um, of course I was quite willing to bask in all the, yeah. the, the, the things that came from it because until you fail, it, you're successful. <laughs> Uh, at least by getting the record deal in the first place, somebody Definitely. who makes the police records and Janet Jackson and, you know, on and on and on, they think I'm going to be one of them in that same league. Yeah. I've yeah. made it. I've been called up to the majors, you know, <laughs> that's a great, um, that's a great analogy. And, and wow. I didn't know I was that good. I'm so good. And the next thing you know, you know, you're starting to breathe, you you know, believe it. And that, that's a, that's a little bit, uh, can be a little bit dangerous, but when I, anyway, got beat up on humbled, if you will, um, needed, needed to do something else, whether it was just think about it. So, um, moved to, to Florida. I got a job, which I was scared to death to do. Take a, a job. job. Yeah. Get a job. You know, I lived in this small town called Sneeds, Florida, 
population 2000. I can't here. imagine that's near to outside of Tallahassee. It is. It's that's uh, pretty rural anyway. Very it is, rural. It is. Uh, it is one wonderful, wonderful place and people though, but yeah, people um, are great. The, I got a job at the largest mental institution in the state of Florida. Doing Chattahoochee is it's called Florida State Hospital it's in Chattahoochee. You, you, it's you being in Florida. It was it's six hundred acres, you know, a, wow. basically a city, of, you know, in all those kinds of places where they put mental in, institutions and prisons in them. You know, let's just put put it them over over there. You know, right. <laughs> in the, the, the small areas, but I got a, a job and it was totally out of my comfort zone. Very fortunate to, to get it, but I had a mentor there. I was the uh, director of media services. Basically I produced a television show uh, for the hospital. That's which, pretty cool. So it put me in with all this video editing stuff and I, it was a state job so it was great benefits you know it kind of took care of me in a lot of adult ways that music you know I, music doesn't yeah and, and with you know, a very you know, rare exception if you're a music guy you know you're you're in the industry and you're successful those things get taken care of insurance you know where you're young you're not getting sick anyway you know unless right. something bad happens to you you're not just not worried about all that stuff and then all of a sudden you get around 30 and you start going, you know, I, there, there, maybe I'm growing up. Am I growing up? I don't know. I think I might be growing up and then you get a little older and, but anyway, it's my, that was my first real job. And I think I was just turning 40. Which that's I pretty good, man. Pretty good. Yeah, that's pretty <laughs> I good. A little, I I uh, thought that was kind of a little victory, um, but yeah. when I got the job, I loved it. And I really went, "Ooh, what was I so scared of?" And though that that broke down a little bit of a, a, f a fear wall, like you don't have to feel like you didn't make it, or oh, there's the guy that didn't make it in music. There's the guy that wasn't. A, didn't have a hit, but these were all things were running through my my brain at the time, and um, yeah, I ended up being um, I worked all over Florida for the whole state, um, doing all kinds of photography and producing videos for Department of Revenue and Army Corps of Engineers and all these state you know uh, en entities um, working. So it was a good state. gig. It was a really good gig, and and then I moved back to Nashville. And How'd you get that job? That's, that's <laughs> it sounds like one of them jobs hard to get. I got a phone call, and uh, I got a phone call asking me if I knew anybody that might want the job. <laughs> and it's pretty random. Said, hey, what is? I said I don't know. What kind of job is it? Uh, just ask a few questions. I said I think I want to apply. You know. I needed to do something different. And Good for you, man. Want, so. And you were pretty successful at that job, it sounds like. So it probably was a big breakthrough for you. And it kept me, it kept me in my creative zone. Yeah. You know, I wasn't sweeping floors and, you know, not there's anything wrong with any of that stuff, but it kept me. No, you weren't a cost accountant. You know. I was in a different kind of studio. Yeah. You know, all, all, the only thing that was different was that there was a thousand, um, you know, mental health uh, residents on the site and 2,000 employees. And that the, the landscape changed. But what I did, I kind of did the same thing with, with painting and music. I just went, oh, the same thing, joys that I was getting out of music, I'll just apply them to this job. Right. I'll write video scripts. Um, you know, and so I just took it and plopped it down into that and it all seemed to fit, you know, that's cool, man. So it worked out for you. That's a nice, uh, happy ending. 
And as you know already, most people in Florida are mentally ill. So there's a ton, <laughs> big market for that shit. <laughs> I'm sure uh, everybody would be surprised to find that I was on the other side of the fence. You know. Oh, that's. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you uh, you're uh, you play guitar and bass. Are you more partial to one over the other? Well, if I were to, I play bass as as out of necessity. Um, gotcha. You know. And I, I'm, I'm a guitar. Here's what I am. I'm a singer who doesn't feel comfortable just singing. That's why I play guitar. Um, I, there's something about it since I started that way. It, I don't feel like I have my uniform on without strapping a guitar on. I, I just don't, it doesn't feel right. I, I sing with the guitar. I, it, ma it makes me do things differently. Um, so really, I'm, I, I like, I, I, bass is, I'm in, in, intrigued by it, but really since I've been working with Dan, I don't play bass very often because Dan's going to grab it and play right. it. Uh, I did on my record because I wanted to do a record where I did everything myself. Dude, know? that's a great record, man. Uh, we'll talk about it in a minute, but it's a really good record. And and when I when I read that you did everything, I was blown away because you literally did everything. You did all the instruments, the mixing, pr you know, production, of course, engineering, uh, mastering. That's a lot of that's a I mean, that's a big shit to do. I mean, it was a great record. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for putting it out. All right, let's talk about your gear for a few minutes. What is your go-to guitar, and what other two would round out your top three? So, I guess, oh, I don't know if it's, so this, I was hoping you're going to pull that one out, yeah. Yeah, this is um, a That Nash. is well-worn, man. Well, but it's an 09, so it's not that it's been, it's, it, so it did not come by this finish, uh, honestly, I guess. Uh, so anybody knows anything about Bill Nash um, and Nash Instruments? He was a Fender custom guy for the 30 years or whatever. And he basically, I guess at his point, he was make, recreating all of these iconic uh, versions of, of Stratocasters and Tellys and other, other items. But he... <laughs> Me and I was do, I was doing a show with Warner. We were in Bristol, Tennessee, and they had a whole room full of Nash guitars in this music store we went to. Warner <laughs> went through, and you know, they're all on the wall. I, I I bet you there was sixty guitars in there. All he, he's out of Nashville. No, I he's not. But I, they, but for it, some it, reason, it, this store had a whole room full of Nash. I've never seen this many in a store, but it was in Bristol, Tennessee of all places. And Warner just walked around and went to all the guitars. You know, he just, he, I mean, he didn't take them down. He just went by and as he walked around the room, he just did that. And he'd hit them one, at a, one after the other. And when he got to the end of the room, he goes, here's the best guitar in the room. And it was that one. And I said, how did you, how do you know that? And he goes, it's the loudest one. For people not, uh, just listen to the audio. It's a beautiful, um, relict black telly, two pickups, uh, but it's relic really nice. And it looks it's a great. 52, basically he, he, uh, Bill Nash built it. It's 52 and he caught it on fire and baptized it in a river. <laughs> I had to have it at that point. One yeah. says best guitar in the room. It's been baptized, caught on fire and baptized. And it has a baseball neck, which I'm, I was never, you know, a, a, I never even considered neck widths or thicknesses until Dan and Warner. And they kind of were telling me like, Oh, you get this and you get this with different necks. And, and really my, just my hands, I guess, from age and stuff, having that big neck actually makes it makes it easier to, to cord. 
So that was that's really great. So it's one I played ninety percent of the time. Uh, it sounds spe- spectacular. Um, my other go to, which is not really a go to, but it's my very first guitar. Um, and it is I bought a sixty four SG in nineteen seventy nine. Oh yeah, you said that for one hundred and twenty five dollars. <laughs> and I have kept it from then on and I still have it and it still plays amazing. Uh, it sounds great. Love the P P nineties. And, um, but I have about 25 instruments. Oh, that's so quite a bit. I, I like, you know, I got a Strat. I got two or three, I got three tellies, a Les Paul, um, several SGs, Acoustics, jazz master, 12 string, baritone, bass, bunch of basses. Um, I just, I like guitars. It's, I'm kind of like, I just like to look at them. Yeah, uh, man. I, I, like you've got them right there by, in, in the back of your, you know, yeah. behind you there. They're, <laughs> it's just so cool to <laughs> the, You know, I would have a, a garage full of cars and maybe I'd drive them every now and then but they're just awesome you know works of art and the, and as a studio guy somebody comes in all of them have a use you know Absolutely. i need a scratch sound i need a, a les paul sound i need this you know you got your choice you know if you didn't bring it with you let me ask you a question while you're talking about that on your record i was listening to and i asked you i forgot the song now was it lie to love yourself it. what's that love, love, is love is okay it sounded like there was a telly and a strat on there mostly a telly but it sounded like a little strat what was it so it's a t- there's a telly and a les paul a telly and a les paul okay yeah. so the les paul is uh i've got a 90 it's, i think it's a 1990 les paul uh it has the seymour duncan uh jimmy what's it called? Whole lot of humbuckers in it, the Jimmy Page. Right. Um, um, st- things. And it sounds really good. It's not my favorite playing guitar, but it sounds amazing. Records great. And I've got, I don't know if you can see it there. It's Marshall. Yeah, I do see it. Uh, that's a 1977 Marshall. Plexi. And it's a, it's a, a hundred watt lead, whatever. You know, I wish I knew all these names and stuff, but it sounds like a million bucks. Um, it looks in great condition. I can't believe that's 50 something years old. Yeah. Um, it looks really, really well. Is that, uh, is that your primary recording amp? Oh, it is. I can get, it works for just about everything, but I've got, I got, well, you kind of see the corner of it over here. I got a, a, one of the new Supros. Right. And I've been digging on that. I still have a 73 Vibrolux that was back in the day when we were touring and were just just starting out touring fender used fender amps were 200 bucks and they would even put them on display they just have a room full of discarded used fender amps and you know they were cheap as dirt and i would just go in and if they'd break i'd just go buy another one so my rig was a my stack was a super and a Vibrolux on top of it. That's and cool. I, ended up, I ended up keeping the Vibrolux all these years. And I, I love it because those things are go for a lot of money now. Yeah, they're, they're all those yeah, old they, vintage Fenders. Everybody in Nashville records out of a Fender. I mean, most of all over, but the vintage Fenders are you know, almost. Well, they take pedals great too. So you can, if you've got, if you can get, you know, just go to a clean platform if you're a pedal junkie like me. It's, I'm embarrassed to show you what I got. It's stupid. I'm, emb- I'm embarrassed by it. Tons of pedals. It's Dude, issue. you're a studio owner. You have to have all this equipment. You know, uh, George Bradfute, I don't know if you know him. Know him. No. He's another, he's, he lives in uh, Jim's Reeve, Jim Reeves' house, which was a 50s country printer. He actually just did Jason Ringenberg's uh, latest, newest album. But he's a studio guy. Got it. He's He had the best... 
the, you know, those things you put on doors that had the shoes in them. You know, you put, oh, you can put pairs of shoes in them. Yeah. So they, they're the whole length of a door. He had one of those and every one of them had pedals. Man, that's a great pedals. idea, but it kind of heavy. I don't know. If know if it was great. And he says, Hey, take this one home with you. And I was buying a 12 string from it. So he said, take this home with you and play around with it on the record. But we actually put it on the first Bluefields record. It's, I don't, I can't remember what we played it on. Him and his brother made it out of wood. It's a, it was a wooden box with a, it didn't even have a knob. You just, you plugged it in and you just pushed on the, you know, button. What was distortion pedal? It was, I, I'm not even really sure. I think it made it a little dirtier, but it's just something they did as kids. And That's he was so willing funny. to let me take it home. I would never have parted with something like that. That's cool. That I'm in good shape. That's cool, man. Uh, any cool stories behind how you acquired any of those guitars? Uh, so my, my SG is probably, um, I bought it from a drummer who needed money to go back home at, for he was moving. He was one of our first drummers. He was the, like the, in, in that very first band, I was talking about the punk band. He was a, he was the guy that knew how to play. Right. Okay. And he, he, so the, the, but the, with, that was a drummer we got later. He didn't stick around very long, but he played some shows with us and he was a, the pro guy in the band. So he made us sound really good. Um, and he was going moving back to Chicago and he says, I, I need some money. And, you know, and I, so I traded him my global SG and 125 bucks for that. It's not a really an in interesting story, I don't guess, but I think I got a good deal. Yeah, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. I think so, man. Uh, what's the best guitar and best amp you've ever played through? Well, I'm going to – I'm sorry. I'm trying to get that little – I'm, since I'm using my phone, it's, I'm getting these announcements. Um, I think that I would say – right now and it changes depending on what the job is but right now the nash telly wow. and this marshall but the marshall's a, a bit much to to you know you can't really go and play a club with it you know you, you can see i got like one of those rivera uh rock crushers on top of it it keeps the volume down but allows you to really turn up the volume you know you can turn it up to eight or nine and just get that awesome marshall gooey out of it and but but it's not bring you know not breaking the windows out sure so that's my favorites you know i i i don't really have a, a i don't really I'm, i don't i don't know i don't <laughs> i like different things at different times and no, I that's cool a lot. no that's that's very common for especially guys in the songs. studio everybody's yeah. got songs in it, you know so whichever one's got the song in it that day is the one i want Hey, tell me the uh, first record you bought. I bought three records in my very first trip to the record store. I think I was 10 or 11 years old. I bought the Beatles' second album, Blood, Sweat, and Tears' Greatest Hits. Great record. <laughs> and uh, uh, Three Dog Night, Golden Biscuits. I love Three it's, Dog Night. It's crazy. I think... I th I, 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 I dig harmony so much. I mean, I love, if I had my druthers, I would be like a professional background singer because I love it. Uh, my mom and she had three sisters and between the four of them and my grandmother, they all sang, you know, in church, I'd be behind them and I'd just pick a part and go along with it. And that's stuck with me to this day. It's like, I got the backgrounds, you know, if you see the movie Ray, you know, where he, he says, I'll just do it myself. And he sings all the girl parts himself. Yeah. You I, could do I, that. that. That's <laughs> awesome. No, that's great, man. Well, you got a skill. Why the hell not? Tough question. Favorite top three desert Island discs just for this moment. I, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I could answer that. And I, I wish I could, um, and the reason why is because I, I, 
I'm not a focused individual to the extent that I like to be. I like, it could be Johnny Cash one minute. Um, it could be the Ramones the next minute. And it could be, uh, you know, Dan's turning me on to some stuff. Every once in a while I'll hear like, a, ooh, I'll tell you who I've been getting into, like Betty Davis. Oh, yeah, funk singer. Great. I had never heard of her. I watched the Netflix thing, and I and I went, and I started listening to this record. But here's the thing. Oh, you I saw the movie? I did. Yeah, it's, it's a great. It's cool. I bought, got all the records. Yeah. I think she has three albums. And they're the, the, the sound of those records. Yeah. Uh, the goats, new Goat's Head Soup re, reissue thing is is pretty rock and roll. I mean, I don't know what they've done to it, you know, but it sounds so good. Um, you know, I loved that record when it came out. Dancing with Mr. D is on there, I think, right? Yep. Uh, yeah, but it. it's sonically though they've done the right the right, right way to modernize the the sonics of it so that it kind of stands up to what, what things are able to produce now. It's you know how it is now. You you get your old records if they haven't been remastered or something. You at fifty eight being in rock and roll all your life, you got to turn shit up loud. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Hear it well, and it's uh. You know, a lot of your, a lot of the old records, like the old original Alice Cooper stuff. You know, I'd probably put a Cooper record in one of my Desert Island things, probably Killer or Love It to Death or something. One of the early, early guys. But they're, they sound like they're on four when they're maxed out. <laughs> yeah, you know? some of those records. They, 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 yeah, they were, yeah, especially if you're listening to vinyl, but even on CD. You know, the AC/DC stuff they redid, and it sounds, of course, spectacular. I'd probably put Highway to Hell or something like that on the list. Now that I'm thinking about it, the never mind the bollocks would probably uh, I'd have to hear it again, you know. I you think. know that wasn't that movie that. uh that was kind of sad that movie in a way. Like she's kind of like a recluse or it was just like you were hoping at the end she was gonna go hang out with the band and meet them and she was like clearly the fact that she let the call be recorded you could tell was a very big thing and she was getting off there as soon as possible i uh, i actually thought the, the the making of the documentary was 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 brilliant as yeah. far as they introduced you to her as she was and really was so unknown so i mean very very un unknown to I'd never even heard of her before. Um, to to for the albums to be as good as they are, I had no idea uh, about anything about her, and they never showed her face. Very strange, wasn't it? Never showed her face. They show a little piece of her face, but I'm going any minute now. They're gonna reveal, and they never did. Yeah, it was it was. I, it, the mystique that's in that that's that's just oh you want to make you want to make somebody come back and talk about it don't give them what they want <laughs> yeah that was, it was a good I, documentary it, it really was and her band too i went those guys made the record yeah it's kind of like um muscle shoals having those two accidental bands of incredible soul players who were just yeah. country boys you know um <laughs> i know just knocks me out and oh well their first one's moved on let's just get some more right <laughs> the same place it's yeah it's crazy it, it is crazy. crazy they struck me like that though because those records are brilliantly recorded yeah there's a lot of uh, that whole era had such great funk i mean there's so many great funk players man uh, you know, I rewatched the um, the James Brown, the Get On Up. Um, I guess they, they were playing everything because of Chadwick uh, passing the actor. Oh, right, yeah. And his version. I've seen Mr. Dynamite, too, and it's fantastic, of course, uh, the, the Jagger produced one. But, man, it's the music is... <sighs> I had a guy on my show... Um, Keith Jenkins, he was James Brown's 
guitar player and MD for the last 14 years of his life. White dude too. Wow. And uh, yeah, he had some stories about him, man. And he does the voice exactly like him. I mean, you're with him every day, 14 years. I'm not surprised, wow. but uh, yeah. Interesting. This interesting guy to hear these stories like firsthand from a guy who lived with him, you know? So, all right, man, tough question. What do you like most about yourself? <laughs> I think I'd have to say, and it's, it is tough because, um, I'm not, I, 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 I don't think I'm a, um, I, I don't know. <laughs> uh, tough question i think that i'm happy that i am still interested enough to to learn new things um i i think that's i think that if you, the you either get to a certain age and you go what is what has molded me is what i am and I'm just going to continue to be a version of that for your whole life, or you continue to learn and grow. And even if you came through um, some, some, uh, I'm really not answering this, this very well. I, I just don't want to be the, I would, I want to be, I just want to keep trying to be a better ver version of my, of myself, you know, and not for myself, you know, for really for everybody else's sake. Everybody else around you. No, I get that, man. Sure. I get that. But you benefit too, which is always a good thing, you know, best decision you ever made. You know, I'm just gonna say a big blanket. I really don't have a specific one because I think they're all versions of me just not being afraid to raise my hand and say, I can do that. Or um, whether it's volunteering for something or not saying no, no to something, not uh, just wanting, wanting to be involved. It's really not a good, good answer. Um, now, tomorrow I'll have a great answer for that question, <laughs> but I'm not very quick when it comes to those types of things. And really, cause I, I, I don't think of myself very often like that. No, but I'll tell you one thing that I've heard you have been motivated or fear has log, you know, b bugs you at times, but you've also been pretty fearless and not a, what you just said you've not been afraid so from an outsider like i see that you may not see that because we always see the worst of ourselves especially if you're the kind of person that beats yourself up like why haven't i this that but i i've seen that i've seen that like this is a guy who like man i'll do it i'll do it do you know how to do it no but i mean I don't play an instrument but i'll put up posters about me playing an instrument and then i'll go learn one in a lesson that's fucking takes a lot of courage. I think that putting on a guitar and having a loud amplifier is almost like a, gives you some superpowers. Yeah, I, I think mean, so. really you can, you can, it's like, I guess like acting, you can become more than you are. Sure. You've got that because all of a sudden you're, you're louder than you are on your own. And especially for, you know, a, Somebody young, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm more, I'm stronger, I'm sexier, I'm, um, you know, all, all of a sudden I've got some uh, abilities to make louder noises, um, uh, be attractive. To yeah, no, all of those things, <laughs> to, man. To 
people and, and, and I get your idea across at the same time, whether that be a song like Kill Me or... <laughs> That's your first Metal hit. Phase, or like the Blue Bills where we just talk about, um, we remember them, but we're really glad we survived them, you know? <laughs> happiest moment or happiest time in your life? I'm pretty damn happy right now. That's awesome. I really think that being on Everyone Loves Guitars. <laughs> Get out of town. Moment of my life. And I mean that. Yeah. At the bottom of my heart, I am. Totally <laughs> 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 no, what's, a, what's the happiest time in your life? Uh, I, I'm going to stick with the same answer, except for the interview part, although that's a very big <laughs> pleasure. I, I'm, I'm having a time of my life right now. I'm doing all the stuff I want to do. Uh, I just finished a record with my buddy Warner. There's a huge um, labor of love that goes into these projects with Dan and Warner and all my friends. And we, we're a good tight family. We love each other. Um, I've got a good, great, loving, supporting wife, and actually, you'd have to to put up with me for any length of time. And not only that, but to put up with the noise that I, I make. You know, she's a, she's a fan, and that's uh, that's worked out big time in my favor of the music that I'm making. And it's um, it's it is very, very fulfilling to. I think it's, they're getting, the records are getting better. I think the songs are getting better. I think my, um, and really through the friendships and relationships I have with Dan and, and Warner, I'm actually reaching out to some additional people. The circle is growing, um, uh, you know, I'm, I email with Stan Lynch. Right on. I'm sorry. That's a big, big fucking deal. Yeah. To, <laughs> to be communicating with, with Stan Lynch uh, and talking about a song or whatever. He, it, it's, it's a big deal. Um, uh, and those guys have brought me kind of in the, in their circle and, and I, hopefully I'm not letting them down. I think everything's, no, I, it feels like we've got a really good team, good family. And we're good support for each other. Um, and we're helping each other, you know? Yeah. Every, every, all these guys, it's a, I told you before we started recording, it's a very cool uh, circle that you're in there, man. Um, has your life been different than what you imagined? I think if I were to look at it in terms of different, you know, I, I have not imagined it being one thing from a certain age and it, and then it not being something else. When I was young, it was drilled into me that I was going to be an architect or an or some, some sort of artist, um, visual artist. And then when I switched to music, my, I, I thought I would be a, um, a, a rock star. I thought I'd be a rock star because, hey, the stars were aligning. I was getting, um, I was on, on my way to be a Got a, a contract, a and yeah, you got it. And, hey, I'm on a bus, you know, let's go. Let's be rock stars. Um, when that didn't happen, and I went, wow, what did I want? I wanted, and I ran, ran away to Florida. I wanted, I wanted to, a house, and I wanted, you know, I wanted to be a, 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 a good relationship, and all these things, and 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 not starve. <laughs> You know, to, to be able to do something else and not um, and feel good about it at the end of the day, and I got that. Um, and and when I did that, I got to do keep doing music. I learned how to be a, a, a producer and a better engineer, and I went through all those hoops. You know, I'm reading articles by 
Eric Amble in out of my little Sneeds, Florida, that he's got in Home Recording Magazine, and I'm reading him. I'm going like, he's doing it. He, I'm, I can do it too. And uh, so then I wanted to be that. And next thing you know, I'm, I'm in a band with Warner and Dan, and um, and and now I'm in a I'm in a, a bunch of bands, you know, and and or at least associated with them and working on on different projects. And it's just so so I don't know how to answer that because it's it's not different. Um, it's just. It just, it's always, it always changed. I'm glad it's always changed. Um, yeah. You know, I guess if I'd gotten stuck at Rockstar and always been, you know, in that status, that'd been okay too. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you have any hobbies outside of music? Um, I will, will say that music is my hunting and fishing. <laughs> I got gotcha. you. Well, people, you know, people that do, because I love it so much that it's not work. Sure. Even though I spend tons of time doing it, it doesn't feel like, like it, 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 it's something that I'd, you know, if I didn't watch it, you know, my wife would be very, very upset at me because I'd stay down here all the damn time. And because I love it so much. It's right. Really, it's just what I want to do. It's what I want to be doing. You know, oh, you're going to make me go on vacation and go to the beach. Oh, that's good. That's a good thing. <laughs> so what do you do? What do you do in a situation like that? Are you able to peel yourself away now? Are you more balanced? Go to you the damn more? beach. Yeah. Okay. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah. Well, I went through a long period of time there. It was like murder pulling me away from my desk. Now I'm yeah. not, I'm pretty foot loose, but there's a long time to get to that stage. Uh, toughest decision you've had to make or most difficult thing you've had to do. You know, I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Like I said, I think I'm, I'm kind of, I'm kind of a medium guy, you know, I don't, there's not been any giant besides a tornado ripping, you know, through and <laughs> tearing trees down into my roof and all that kind of stuff. There's no, been no real big cataclysmic moments that have been very tough. I'm, I'm really fortunate for that. Um, Dude, that's great. I hope you come back on the show in a few years and nothing's changed. That's awesome. Yeah, me too. I'm going to yeah. blame you. You can. People blame me for all sorts of shit. Don't worry. <laughs> Two more questions, Joe, and thank you so much for your time being such a sweet guy. Uh, most important lesson life has taught you? And everything that's coming to mind just sounds so, uh, you know, tr trite. It's all right. Go. You, it sounds you, like you a go. postcard, but you know, I, right. I, I, I just want to. Um, I, I don't want to stop doing something because I'm too old to <laughs> to still be doing it. I'm, I'm really um, happy that I'm. I'm I get the opportunity to do it and, you know, I'm happy that you know, I've got good health and, and stuff. Uh, I don't know. I've, I've really lost track of the question there. I'm sorry. It was a uh, most important lesson life has taught you. Yeah. Um, just don't take yourself too seriously. I mean, I, I guess, and maybe, um, li listen more than you talk and, you know, all these kind of postcard things, give more than you take and love more than you hate and all that kind of stuff. Every bit of it's, you're better for it at the end of the day. Totally. Yeah. But those, they're ad they're old adages because they're so true. I mean, it, you know, there's a it's lot a of John Lennon song. <laughs> What's that? It's a John Lennon it's a John song. Lennon song. Just be a good John Lennon song. Yeah. Be a good John. That's a good one. That's a good one. <laughs> 
<laughs> as far as age goes, man, I've had three guys on this show over 80. So that's not, wow. yeah. Yeah. Uh, biggest and last question, biggest change in your personality over the last 10 years and how much of that change has been intentional and how much is just a natural part of aging? I think I'm mellower. I, I think that I'm, um, I, I, I'm less, less controlling. <laughs> you had to qualify that yeah, in case and, your wife listens or your, or, or no, Dan or no, Warner. No, I, I just want, I've got a lot of bullshit called on me, you know, less, uh, less. Yeah. I don't want you to, I'm not saying I'm not controlling. I'm saying I'm less I, controlifying. I, He's clarifying. I'm not nearly as bad as I used to be is what I'm trying to say. I hear you, man. <laughs> <laughs> but not just that, you know, it's, uh, I, I hope I'm, um, uh, I try to, I'm trying to be less opinionated. Um, and maybe it's a sign of the times or whatever, but I feel like when you start something off with, I think this, or I believe that, um, that might be all well and good, but if you're, but I think there needs to be some, you want to be able to back it up with, with something. I, at least personally for me, I'm trying to back up my feelings with something, you know, whether it be, um, uh, the, just, just, a, I need a better reason than just because I just happen to feel that way. Sure. And I'm not saying anything bad about anybody does that. I'm just personally trying to do that yeah. for myself. Not trying to be Spock, you know, but I'm trying to be somewhere where I'm less, less um, whipsawed by emotions. Sure. That's a good answer, man. <laughs> Live long and prosper. Yeah, man. You sounded just like him too, actually. <laughs> you, you did that on purpose, I'm assuming, right? No. <laughs> yeah, you sounded just like him. Uh, man, let me tell people what you got going on because you got a lot going on. All right. First of all, Joe released a record not that long ago. It's called Good, Bad, Right, or Wrong. And uh, it's a great record, man. If you're into classic kind of rock, he's got some – he played everything on there. Uh, all the instruments, production, engineering, great riffs on there. It's a really cool classic rock record. Um, it's something to be super proud of. I, I thought it was excellent. Uh, the Hang Fires, which is Joe, uh, Greg Morrow, drummer who is on this show, Jen Gunderman, who is um, keyboard player for Cheryl Crow, and Dan Baird, who is also on here. They have a band called The Hang Fires. The album is Curly Q, right? That's the name. Yep. Let me pull that up. Uh, another really good record. It just came out. I would encourage you to listen to it and buy it. Uh, my favorite song is actually the last one, Bullet Named Karma. I like that ah, one. Cool. Yeah, good song. Did you write that one? Uh, yep, me and Dean. Yeah, great song, man. Uh, the Blue Fields, which is uh, Joe's ongoing project with Dan Baird and Warner Hodges and uh, Brad Pemberton is, is in the band as well. Um, they're constantly releasing stuff. What is the, the I have a note here. I said, I said, sure. right knee last the record. record. The newest record is called uh, day in the sun. It was released a little earlier this year. This is what I wrote day in the, and I'm like, that can't be the fucking Close title enough. of the record. It's like, it's called day in the sun, not yeah. day in the, uh, I told you that would be a problem. I know me. Um, Okay, so what, I, what I'd love you to do is check out all these records, uh, Good, Bad, Right, or Wrong uh, by Joe, Day in the Sun, The Blue Fields, and Hang Fires, uh, Curly Q just came out. They're all really cool records. If you like rock and roll, you're going to like all these records. They're really good music, very well-written songs. Um, if you uh, go to joeblanton.com, you can go to all these websites, hangfires.com, bluefields, go to joeblanton.com since it's easiest since Joe's doing the interview. And uh, you can buy all the records that you want on there. There's links to everything. 
also, if you're interested in working with Joe in a production or engineering capacity, there's a contact button on there and you can reach out to him. Please let him know, like give him some links to your music, let him know what, why do you think it's a fit or how he could help you so he could at least digest and understand what you're looking for and, and listen to your music to see if it's a fit. And I'm sure he'll get back to you in a timely manner. Uh, as far as social media, are you guys on there with all of this? Sure, you can go to the Bluefields uh, on Facebook, or you can go to Joe Blanton. Um, anyway, and, and we're just there. You can uh, also be sure to to check out uh, the chefs with Dan yes. Stan Lynch, um, and that's a fantastic record. You and produce also, that as well. Y yeah, and uh, I'm a co-producer on there. I'm, I'm the secret chef. As you He's know, a secret chef, right? I mentioned that yeah. earlier, right? And Warner, the new record from Warner is called Just Feels Right. And it's fantastic. It's fantastic. He's got a, he's got a campaign going right now. If, the, if this uh, interview comes out in time, it's uh, uh, they're under consideration for uh, Americana Album of the Year uh, for a Grammy. So how do we get involved in that? How do I like, what do, what do we do to support that? Okay, so you can go to warnerehodges.com. You could go to, uh, actually, you can reach it through the bluefields.com. Uh, I have it at the bottom of the page. I have a graphic there that links to their Facebook page, and it's a, it's a sharing type of situation. So, you know, it's part of the process they do at the Grammys for people that are, uh, you know, getting considered for an award. So he's uh, uh, being considered for two awards there. You can go check it out. But Warner's Facebook page will have everything you need. Great, man, because he's been, I'm going to, I need to post that this week because he's been so supportive of this show, man. And I'm, I'm really, I got to do that. And I'm so happy that I, there's something I can do. Warner's a sweetheart. Um, his tour got wrecked by COVID this, this year. He's got some more dates coming in for next year, which is great. But, you know, Warner, we were all kind of knocked backwards. We worked on the record really hard. We got, a, I think it's his best solo record uh, to date, uh, very, a uh, lot of Jason Scorcher's flavors on this record. And, uh, to me, that's a, a great thing. Uh, but you know, all the dates kind of went away and, and it's, it's tough for people out there that make their living on the road and Warner's one of those guys. So yeah, man, it's, it's horrible, man. I don't know any, any word on anything like opening up next year have you got any like sure warner's warner's starting to get some uh fe festivals and and stuff so in europe maybe, yeah in okay europe. so Great. really you know a lot depends on the situation of course and you know what they let us in or you know can we get out um you know what can you the, get back in that's another yeah, one yeah and you know he it, it's 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 tough it's a, it's anybody's call right now we can just kind of Let's just hope every uh, they find some way to to reduce its impact. So yeah, everybody man. can get back to work. Everybody needs to get back to work, man. For sure. Joe, thank you very much for everything. I really appreciate it. And Oscar, thank you for listening. He'll get a kick out of that. Uh, anything else that I, you want to talk about or promote? Anything else that I, I, I left out? I think we've covered it. I don't, I don't know if anybody's talked to me this long, including my wife and <laughs> no man it's a pleasure you're such a nice guy man you had a really interesting career and uh i'm glad you're you know in the right place now man you seem like you're in the good zone so keep it up and you'll come back on the show in a couple of years you'll have some more projects to talk about well i'd love to have you back on and, and uh, promote them hey listen thanks for everything i appreciate it joe and uh you, you ever come you guys ever play down here um, well, not Dan's not touring. What, what, so what's, what happens with the blue fields? Um, who knows? Um, you know, right now it's been, it's a non-issue. I think what right. we're going to do is we're going to, uh, we've got a out of print first album that I get, you know, almost daily requests to re reprint it. So awesome. we've got some, uh, new songs that we've done that we may just re-release that first record and add some new material to it oh cool uh, just what everybody's just you know one thing that's good about nashville is we've all got you know rigs and recording rigs and 
And now that we all kind of, we're almost family, we, we know how to interact with one another and still stay safe and healthy and still manage to keep music flowing. So that's cool, man. Let's keep making music. If you can't take it on the road, we will, we'll, we'll have a ton of it to listen to. Awesome. So go to the Bluefields, go to bluefields.com. I'm sure you got an email list there and just sign up and then check these guys all out on social media. Again, Bluefields, Hang Fires, Joe Blanton, and The Chefs. And check all those bands out. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this, please share it on your social media channels. We appreciate your support. Thanks very much to Joe Blanton. Please support Joe's music. Again, Joe Blanton, Hang Fires, Bluefields, uh, Dan at The Chefs, and uh, hit him up on social media. And if you want to work with Joe, in an engineering or production capacity, hit him up uh, to his contact form and uh, he will not be corny with you. Uh, most important, especially nowadays, man, remember that happiness really is a choice. So choose wisely. <laughs> be nice. Go play your guitar. And have fun. Till next time. Peace and love, everybody. I am out. Joe, thank you so much, brother. <laughs>